human creature, not eternal. Where is he now? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 speaks of the Son and says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. One of the greatest, most beautiful truths of the Christian faith is that this night, the sinless Son of God, the God-man, the Lamb standing as if slain, stands in the presence of the Father for me and for every person who has faith in him. And that is the surety of my peace with God. That is the surety of my salvation. It's not found in myself. It's found in the fact that there is one who has entered into the holy place. I am united with him. His sacrifice is my sacrifice. His resurrection is my resurrection. His righteousness is my righteousness. And he stands in the presence of the Father. Finished. It is finished, he said. The lamb standing as if slain. And if I am in him, then the Father sees his son, his work completed. And if I am in him, then I have a perfect relationship with the Father. That's the basis of justification by faith. That's the basis of understanding the basis of God's grace. It's beautiful, but how does it work in oneness theology? Because if the, Jesus was the Father and the Son, then who is Jesus now standing before? Because has the Father left the Son, and now the Son's just a human being, and the Father's become the Holy Spirit? And so who is, is, is Jesus now just a, is just a human nature appearing in the presence of the Holy Spirit? That's not what Scripture teaches. And so you see, these are not just side issues for us. These touch on the very gospel itself. So I want to ask you as the audience, focus upon the thesis. Did the Son exist as a divine person distinguishable from the Father prior to his incarnation? That's the question this evening. Now you see why it's so important. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you to Dr. White for opening the case for the affirmative, which is the orthodox position, and it's the status quo. With a less popular and possibly more difficult argument, we are now going to invite Mr. Roger Perkins to the stand to open the negative case. Let's make him welcome. Thank you so much. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. and. I first want to mind my manners and say how much I greatly appreciate um, Mr. Ireland and this local congregation here for having us out. Um, as Mr. White has already indicated, it's certainly a long way to go to fuss and argue, but, but I'm glad I came and I'm glad to be here. And in fact, they've treated me so well that if they want me to come back and fuss and argue again, well, just let me know. I'll be glad to do it. Uh, but I certainly do appreciate and I appreciate Mr. White being here as well. Um, but I, I believe that Mr. White and I would both agree, and it may be the only place we do agree tonight, but this speaks volumes for your quest for truth and for your desire for truth. However you may conclude that truth, still, it speaks volumes for your quest for truth, and we're greatly humbled by that. I want to say at the outset that no remarks whatsoever uh, are intended personally uh, um, against Mr. White or against anyone else in this building. Um, we are here because we care. But we do have to plainly identify our distinctives. So let me, let me briefly do that. Let me get into um, our, our distinctive positions, which have already been established to some extent. Um, but the Trinitarian and the oneness construct, there are paramount reasons of why we have such a vast difference. Uh, basically, the reason is that we have an entirely different hermeneutical approach. That is, we have different launching pads. Typically, the Trinitarian starts with the New Testament and works their way back into the Old Testament, as my opponent has done tonight. That is, Trinitarians usually begin with the plurality of the New Testament distinctions of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
and then they end with the same plurality because they begin with a plurality. Oneness, folks, by contrast, begin with the foundation of the Old Testament, and we work from the concrete upward. We begin, as did the New Testament writers, with the Old Testament scriptures that declare that Yahweh is numerically one. Likewise, we end up with the same conclusion that Yahweh is numerically one. The Old Testament concepts prepare us to understand the message of the New Testament. As the Bible says that the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. And the New Testament writers directly quote the Old Testament text approximately 300 times. Out of the 27 New Testament books, 20 endorse the Old Testament and its Hebraic concepts through quotes and references. Only six of the New Test Old Testament books, rather, are not quoted in the New Testament, and the Old Testament comprises roughly 70% of the Bible as a whole. When you combine the direct quotes, references, and allusions in the New Testament to the Old Testament, it references the Old Testament approximately 3,000 times. It's an educational principle, ladies and gentlemen, that you work from the known to the unknown. You work from the concrete to upwardly. No carpenter builds a house and begins with the roof and works his way down. You always start with the foundation and work your way upward. I will very respectfully tonight tell you that the Trinity doctrine in our estimation has a faulty foundation. They always begin with the roof, if I could put it like that, of the New Testament. No one learns calculus before they learn arithmetic. No one learns Shakespeare before they learn the English al alphabet. Later revelation builds upon former revelation, not drastically alters it or amends it, particularly when it comes to God's very identity. The results in our different starting points is that oneness people understand the New Testament distinctions between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which we readily, identify, which we readily concede, uh, as arising in the incarnation. This explains why we never see Father and Son distinctions in the Old Testament. Trinitarians understand the New Testament distinctions to be between three divine, eternal, co-equal individuals. My opponent has not hesitated one bit elsewhere to use the word individual as applied to the persons of the Trinity. The Trinitarians read back into the Old Testament instead of using it as a foundation, as did the New Testament writers. And the proposition tonight is, is basically that the Father and the Son exist prior to the Incarnation. Now, if this is the case, we should have no problem finding the Son in the Old Testament. But yet my opponent has appealed to Scripture after the Incarnation, not prior to the Incarnation. But yet I would ask, where is he at in the Old Testament? We don't find him in the Old Testament. Because Trinitarians begin with New Testament plurality, when they try to fit numerical monotheism into the equation, they wind up with the number one, of being a oneness of unity instead of allowing its most natural usage to be the cardinal numerical one. Probably going to be assume, asserted tonight that we assume that the number one is one person instead of one being. Yet I'll tell you at the outset, there is absolutely no Hebrew or Greek distinction offered on the pages of the Bible separating being from person. Thus, the entire Discussion is removed from the pages of Scripture, contrary to the sola and the tota scriptura that we heard about tonight. I submit to you that no biblical distinction will be found between person and being. We are both a what, a being, and a who, a person, at the same time. And we are in God's image. We are his reflection.